All right, and pronouncing your name, is it Mads or Mods? <laughs> it's Mess. Mess. Thank you. I'm glad I asked. That would have been terrible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it's very typical Danish name, and there's like so many people who, who don't know outside of that, like how it's yeah, actually Yeah, totally guilty. Photography TV. We're here to educate, entertain, and inspire you around photography. Today, I'm excited to introduce Mess Peter Iverson. He is a phenomenal landscape photographer and a fellow YouTuber. Uh, Mess, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. All right. So, Mess, I tell everyone uh, that I believe every photographer has a story. Let's get started. Tell us your story as a photographer. Oh, as a photographer, uh, that's a long story. Um, and as a background, like I'm, I'm educated a school teacher, and I have a master degree in educational philosophy. Um, and while I was doing my master's degree, I really, really fell in love with photography. I borrowed my dad's uh, old, yeah, well, you call it a, a Canon T2i in US. It's called 550D here. Okay. Um, and, and I started learning how to use the raw uh, <laughs> pictures, yes. how to edit them. And I found out like, whoa, I can go into the garden and I can make these beautiful pictures of the fern and so forth. And then I've just tried like a lot of different things. Like for a long time, I actually mainly focused on portrait photography and that sport photography like Joel Grimes does with taking a picture in studio and then combining it with a background. Uh, I did that for a fairly long time, but after a trip to Iceland, uh, where I just wanted to like, now I just want to try landscape photography and go to Iceland. Uh, actually, after I've seen like that uh, F-stoppers behind the scenes with Elia Lucardi and photographing the world. Yeah. So I just went there myself for 20 days and I have basically only done landscape photography since wow so that okay. that, that would be it <laughs> that's awesome okay man so that spurred a lot of questions in my mind let's start with yeah. education uh or going to school for education when did you make that pivot to full-time photographer uh and, and no longer pursuing the education as your career um well it was sort of like a long over a long period of time, I think. Sure. Um, I when, when I finished my master's degree, I uh, went to what we call in Denmark uh, a folk high school. And that is where you normally pay to go. And in this case, it was to do a lot of gymnastics. And while I was there, uh, we I was on a team which did a lot of project management. And because I was like, I don't know, seven, eight years older than most of uh, the, the people there, I had a lot of freedom, so I mainly just went and took a lot of pictures and made some videos and so forth. So it actually got enhanced that I ah. did more video and photo while I was there. And then I was hired for half a year to work there as a photographer and also a bit educator and teaching photography. And when that ended, uh, I got a, I got a, what's it called? Yeah, I got a job in a photography store and I was okay. there for half a year and after I've tried that I was like I'm not going to work in a photography store anymore <laughs> because that is um, that's not photography uh, <laughs> so after that I was sure that even though it's hard to to work yourself up and get all the jobs and so forth uh, you of course have to like for me, I, I needed to do what I loved to do. Great. I was suffocating, uh, doing, talking with customers all the day and selling stuff and like, oh, you should buy a Canon camera, you should buy a Nikon camera. Really, in, in the end, I really don't care myself what camera people to use. So that's basically it, yeah. That's good. Now, right yeah. now, obviously, you're a full-time photographer. Are you all landscape photography or different genres? I think you mentioned earlier you've, started with different genres, but what, how are you currently uh, set up as a business? Uh, as a business right now, I would say I am like 2% landscape photographer yeah. and 98% uh, videographer. But okay. it is kind of changing. Like I'm, I'm trying and one can say that's like a luxury thing that when I get job offers, I only take the jobs which makes a huge amount of money. So <laughs> I... I do a lot of video 
geography so that I can spend my money on traveling and, and so right. forth because that is where most of the money is and I haven't really cracked the code yet for how to live as a landscape photographer. So from what I've heard is that you have to have a lot of small incomes. Okay. This I only had my, my first job as a landscape slash cityscape photographer this spring where okay. I, I did a lot of pictures of Aarhus for a, for a client here in Aarhus. So awesome. it's going the right way, but yeah. Yep. I don't think you're alone in that. In fact, as you saw where, where you and I connected was when I interviewed Thomas Heaton, he even said like, he's not full-time landscape at this point. So exactly. I totally understand it, but clearly you have a passion for it. Uh, let's talk about your travels. You've mentioned them a few times that most of your images don't come from Denmark. They come from other adventures. From what I've seen on your channel, you've gone to some phenomenal places and captured some amazing images. Talk about some of the most memorable trips and uh, just talk us through your travels a little bit. Oh yeah, it's uh, my mem most memorable. I, I I remember them all because there's actually not that many of them. Okay. Um, a lot of people are like, "Mess, you travel all the time," and I'm like, "Exactly, no, I'm." I'm really not. <laughs> you when just I'm go like, big when you do. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So I went to to Iceland for all in all forty five days, wow. divided into three three travels. Uh, I did the first alone uh, back in the uh, autumn 2015 okay. and uh, then I went like a bit more than half a year later like a year ago uh, during summer and then I went again uh, last uh, autumn um, and and those three times was actually like I've only been to Iceland as a landscape photographer uh, okay. until until that. And then, like a month after, I went to the U.S., uh, did uh, the West Coast, and uh, yeah, that's that, that was <laughs> amazing. Um, so me and a, a friend from gymnasium, we hired a, a juicy car, a juicy RV rentals, and and then we simply just went uh, from Los Angeles and went into Yosemite and to San Francisco and up the coast through Oregon all the way to Washington. Took the Columbia River Gorge down again, and then into the desert, and Utah, Arizona, and all that. And and I just like when to get inspiration, I simply just look at Instagram. What do I like myself? Where do I want to go? Um, then I found a, a few sites with a bit of like inspiration, where to go and so forth. And I have seen so many locations after I come home where I'm like, I drove just past that. <laughs> I, I, I could easily take the exact same route and, and only shoot new things, that's for sure. Oh, that's uh, incredible. The, it's, there is a, a reason why uh, California and, and Utah and Oregon are, are so famous for landscapes because it is incredibly phenomenal uh, what's over there. And and I, I well, you can easily live in California alone and only do California for landscape photography your entire life. Uh, that that alone is wow. just a, yeah. absolutely. All right, um, so amazing trips. Yeah. Let's talk about some of those destinations. They're not unknown destinations. You know, millions of people go there every year. How do you, as a photographer, capture unique images in places like that? Obviously, the inspiration's there, but how do you make something unique that is so traveled to? Yeah, <laughs> that, 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 that's a really good question. Um, I, I think it comes down to um, like uh, the weather, of course, um, but like uh, let's say a, a place like John Wayne's Point in, uh, in Monument Valley that has been shot in all kinds of weather at all times of year. Um, at all times of day, so it's it's almost impossible to make anything original there. So I will I I don't want to generalize, but I think it would come down to the post processing, how you edit your images. Um, that that would be it. Yeah. From what I've seen on landscapes in my own my my own landscapes, I never feel like have the pop and the the wow from just a, a final image perspective that I see from some of yours, Thomas Heaton's, etc. So talk us through maybe a few post processing tips to make that difference uh, that an average person like myself just may not know. No, oh yeah, well it's it's it's. Uh... It's it's hard to talk about exactly that because sure. it's just like a normal workflow because that's just how I usually do. So I don't know what's special. Uh, so everything goes through Photoshop, and I uh, use Camera Raw. I, I actually 
very rarely use Lightroom. Okay. Uh, I just pop it into Camera Raw and I use Bridge. And uh, it might be a bit old school, I guess, <laughs> to, to do that, but uh, it works for me. And uh, I rarely hit the clarity slider. I uh, I add a lot of like local contrast. I, okay. I work a lot in, in the tones. Yeah. Um, and as uh, Nick Page said in, in the interview we did with him, that the, the, the normal mistakes are to like bring down the highlights and push up the shadows. So you yes. get like a flat picture. And I did that a lot myself for a long time. I'm guilty of that. <laughs> it, it happens to everybody because what you learn is that you need to see details in both shadows and highlights. So that's only normal and uh, can't blame anyone for doing that um but yeah going working locally again as nick page says like if if i look at his pictures i see a lot of like my own editing style in it so it's kind of the same um but but working locally and and adding contrast to either highlights and uh, shadows and like really controlling also like midtones and also such things it's it's a bit hard to talk about uh, easier to actually show so i might make a tutorial or whatever on that so <laughs> yeah i think that'd be awesome so definitely uh one request for that right here um let's just talk about working locally in a in a typical image how many different layers will you have uh that you're working through i don't know 20 plus wow really 20 plus yeah probably something like that but i i, I work non-destructively when i think my image is done I, I close it down, then I wait a day or two, and then I go back to it, and then I, I see, does this work at all? Because you usually stare yourself blind on what you're sitting and editing. That's a good tip. I, like, I love the tip. I work through it, but then give it a day before you finalize it, because you may come back and you've just got kind of caught up in a direction that perhaps you want to want to tweak it a little bit. I like that. Exactly, exactly. It's uh, it, 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 it's really funny what the brain and the eyes do. Uh, with my background in, in philosophy, I've, I've spent a lot of time like um, studying uh, epistemology and, and, and all those kind of like neuroscientific things which how, how the eyes can like yes. cheat you and, and the brain can cheat you and you think you see something which you really don't and so forth. Wow. I'm, and I'm also a, a little a little bit colorblind, like not as bad as Joel Grimes, but I am a little bit colorblind, so I often don't see when it's too red. Mm. Uh, so yeah, I always have to like look at different screens and so forth to like see and ask people, is this too red or not? So, That's good, okay. Yeah. You're giving some great tips. Obviously, we talked a lot about post-processing. Take us through now, perhaps on the front end of it, capturing. Give us a few tips as it relates to just making sure you walk away with a, a great image in the moment. Uh, be there at the right time okay. uh, when the light is great. Um, work on your composition. Uh, there's so many rules, like a lot of that there's this thing going on in the photography community that you can do whatever you want because you're an artist. And that's true. We live in the Western world. We are free to do what we want. But when you go into art, uh, which I didn't study before I actually started studying photography, um, I, I didn't know that there were so many like rather objective rules about mm. what a good picture is. Like I've heard all the rules about composition, rules of thirds and the Fibonacci, uh, whatever, all, all those things. But there are so many rules when it comes to color, color theory and all sorts of really, really complex compositions you have to bring in. And what does this mean if you do that? And what does that mean if you do that? And do you only work in warm tones or cold tones? And all sorts of things which you can put into your landscape photography to help tell the story and what you want. And I can honestly say that a lot of these rules, you learn them over time so they get layered back here and you don't sit and you work towards exactly that. What, right. And that's what you want. So, so it's not like, oh my God, Mess is thinking all, all these things into his pictures. That's why they're great. No, no, it's, it's really not like that. It's more like a hit and miss, I guess, for the most part. Okay. So, yeah. Um, so, so when you are out in the field and you want to, to go um, get that one good picture, 
uh, it's about being there at the right time, at the right moment. Um, and then for the most part, for me, it's about thinking what can this scene bring to the picture? Like th these days, I'm kind of contradicting myself because these days I'm actually trying to work out how to make a great landscape photo uh, with the help of post-processing, of course, in, uh, in full daylight. Like the rules are don't shoot at noon because the sun is just straight down and so forth. But if there's a rule, I will be the first one to try and break it. Uh, and 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 see if 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 it holds up. So I am kind of trying to work out ways to go around that and yes. and so forth. It, it's a project I'm working on. So yeah, oh, that's a great idea. All right, so yeah. let's stick with that to some extent. I think it's related. So you went to Yosemite. I went to Yosemite last year also, um, and I noticed when I was watching your videos that the first time you were there, the weather wasn't giving you anything unique, wasn't giving you anything special. Now. What I saw is you came back and captured some pretty great images at a different time where the weather did cooperate. Uh, but when I was there, I didn't have the opportunity to go back. And it literally was open skies, no clouds, kind of flat sunsets the whole time. And it's kind of in line with what you're saying of, hey, I can still challenge myself to make something great. What are some ways, if the weather's not giving you anything unique to work with, how do you still walk away with something special? Well, if it's a clear sky, there, there, there's a few things uh, like I've come up with, and and I kind of found out when I was in uh, in Monument Valley and in uh, Sao Paulo uh, National Park. I think that's how it's pronounced. Okay. Uh, down with a cactus, um, and we only had clear sky there too. And I started using my polarizer. Um, of course, depending on in what direction you shoot and so forth, I, sh I show about that in in my recent Monument Valley video that you have to shoot in the right direction if you want to get that very dark blue sky. Okay. Um, that that removes some of the brightness from the sky so you can have more emphasis on the the, the subject matter you're shooting or the object you're shooting. Um, a good example would be uh, one of Ansel Adams' pictures he, he took of a half dome where uh, I don't remember the name of it, but it's it's pretty it's pretty iconic. It's a very black. It's black and white, right? But it's black uh, sky, and there's no clouds at all. Okay. So he put all the emphasis on the half dome, and then the background is just like what you would call low key. So that would be a way to go around it if you want something minimalistic. Um, another way would be simply just to leave out the sky <laughs> of the picture. Don't yes. shoot it. If there's nothing there, don't don't <laughs> shoot it. Um, uh, and yeah, of course, then use shadows, find out like if you don't want to shoot at, at noon, then wait until the sun goes a bit further down towards the horizon. The light will change. Okay. Uh, so so that would be a few ways to go around. And of course, in post-processing, just like change the sky. So <laughs> <For> sure. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I don't have I don't have my, many ethics on that. Just like I want to make it, even though it's it's edited, I want it to look fairly realistic when it comes to lighting directions and so yes. forth. It, it, it should, in theory, be, be realistic, even though it wasn't when I shot it. That's good. So you'll do composites and things like that to you know yeah, enhance yeah. things, but do it in a way that makes it look real, which uh, I think is what the end result's all about, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So something like that. Something okay. Like that. Awesome. One thing I've noticed that I like about your channel, obviously you'll show the story, you'll show the, the best images throughout, but at the end you, you put, in a few cases, you'll put hey, other snaps and you'll just show some, some, some images going through. So talk us through, in your mind, what's the difference between snaps that, oh, these are good images versus this is an image that's really worth highlighting and potentially selling. What makes it breaks the, the difference? Hmm. Yeah, that's also a good question. Um, many snaps, uh, I don't really put my tripod down and start thinking about composition. I don't think much about lines and so forth. I just like, oh, that's pretty. Click. Okay. Um, and and then when I come home, like either it 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 could be a fairly good shot. I could be lucky because I I do of course do something, <laughs> which is uh, I don't think, but well, it's on on the back, so of course. I just. Do. Um, and then I see something which is pretty, which often is pretty, like how the sun exactly hits the tree and so forth. Um, so, so the difference between snapshots and, and professional pictures, it's, 
it's really hard to talk about because it comes down to definitions and it comes down to I don't know how much work is put into it. I I I wouldn't even dare to say that because right. a lot of photographers could can just go and nail it without even thinking about it. So I I don't know. It, it, it's as if we have like invented this language within the photography community. We know what a snapshot is. Yeah. But it's hard to actually define what it is. So That's so good. yeah. When when I just put like pictures in the end is just to show whatever there's also to see and maybe inspire a bit more. I don't know. So yeah, no, that's good. I think it's a fine line. Obviously there's a lot of subjectivity to it. Um, so <laughs> let's talk about when you do have that professional image, that one that really popped, um, what are you doing currently? You mentioned, you know, it's only about 2% of your business at this point, but what are you doing to, uh, you know, drive, drive income from landscape photography uh, and the options that come from that? Well, um, for the job I got this spring, I uh, I was uh, the the guy who who searched. He he was he works at a at a firm who needed some landscape photography stuff on their walls. They didn't actually okay. know what they wanted at that time, so they wanted. So in the beginning, we were talking a lot about like all my Iceland pictures and uh, a few from the U.S. and so forth at that point. But he found me through my website. He simply just Googled. Uh, I think lands uh, in Danish landscape photography, uh, Aarhus, and then my page came up, and then he saw it, and then he was like, "Oh, let's use him." He was also like searching for other photographers, but but mainly, uh, I I think when it comes to that, people coming from the outside is either the network or it's uh, search engine optimization, um, and yep. and I I have a. You, I don't think you can call it a degree, but I, I did a semester on digital marketing. So okay. I, I, I know a bit about uh, SEO and so forth. And if you also you look at my YouTube channel, I, I, I try to really search engine optimize all my stuff because Good. even though I, I truly believe that content is king, uh, it's important to also be able to reach out. Like you can have the best content, but if yes. you are not able to say hello here i am <laughs> uh, then people won't see you uh, at all so i i don't think i would ever have found photography tv if it wasn't for thomas heaton Agreed. so i i think it's it's extremely important that we yeah support each other in the network or in the community uh, as much as we can so yeah that's great I, I i think that that would be the best answer search engine optimization because i've only really got that one single job for landscape photography yeah that's good but it's also even for those watching that don't have a youtube channel and that's not important having a website having a place to show their work is i think the key message there exactly exactly Good. Meds, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, I think it was a phenomenal conversation. I'll encourage people to go check out your YouTube channel. Certainly subscribe to both of us here on YouTube, uh, Photography TV and Meds Peter Iverson. Meds, thanks for joining us. You're very welcome. Thank you for being here.